All right, then, if you have your Bibles with you, we ask you to turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Revelation chapter 21, in the first verse, the Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor, care, nor crying, neither uh, shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make, a new, uh, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto thee that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall and he shall be my son. But the but the fearful and unbelieving and, and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and the liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone this is the second death let's pray dear lord we thank you and praise you for an opportunity to meet in the middle of the week lord to see your people and to meet with them lord we give you praise for that god we thank you uh for your many blessings on our church and we pray that you would continue to bless us open this word to us tonight, that you would uh, mingle it with the Holy Spirit, that would bring understanding to our own hearts, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, some somewhat familiar verses of Scripture uh, concerning the uh, new heaven and the new earth that will be after the former things are purified or taken away. Now, uh, John uh, had these series of visions from the Almighty, and he wrote down with what he had. Now, uh, I'll say this, some of it is figurative, but a lot more of the book of Revelation is literal than we want to think. You know, uh, I've had a lot of people say, what about the dragon, and what about this, and what about that? Well, uh, I understand there is some figurative speech, but unless it indicates it's figurative, then we got to take it for, for wholesale value for exactly what, what it's going to be. Now, this is the culmination of a thousand years. Uh, there had been a thousand year reign while sin existed, and then sin rose up as it always does and tried to attack the throne of God. And this time the Lord Jesus come down and destroyed everything, burnt the earth off, and now something new begins. And the first verse he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, the reason, uh, the, the reason for that, the former earth was corrupted, it was full of sin, it was full of anguish, and the new heaven came to match the new earth, and they were descending down and were new things. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there were no more sea. Now, uh, again, I take that as a very literal thing that in, in the kingdom that's coming that we will be in a place where there is no sea that exists. It will be a dry plain. And you say, well, how could that be? Well, uh, I don't fully understand it, but I know it didn't rain prior, prior to the days of Noah. So all those things the Lord God has under his control, and he has it under his ability, and he will, uh, he will control it what seems good to himself. Verse 2, I, John, saw the holy city, 
New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, uh, you, you have to think, you have to think about this. You know, there's, uh, uh, this bride belongs unto the Lord God Almighty. It is, uh, it is New Jerusalem. It is the purified bride of the Lord God Almighty. The Jewish people, the Jewish, uh, the, uh, the embodiment of the goodness of God married to him. And, and we'll get to see that. We'll get to behold that. We'll get to enjoy that. And if you know your Bible, he's already addressed the bride before this. The bride belongs to Christ. This belongs to God Almighty. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Uh, and, and I believe the, uh, uh, and we'll see that just in a minute, that the, if you remember, the old wilderness tabernacle was moving. And, and, when, the, and when God uh, lighted the sky with smoke or fire, they would move toward it. It was always on the move. And here we have something very much akin to it coming down, but this time it's going to be stable throughout the ceaseless ages. God's people, if you'll follow the history of God's people, whether the Jews or the Christians, all through this book, they've always been movers because people didn't like them. People uh, wanted to get rid of them. But here, they'll be stationary forevermore. And I heard a voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, for this dwelling place to occur, sin has to be done away with. <clears throat> now, in the thousand year reign, if I understand the Bible like I think I do, sin will still exist. It, it will be there. There, there is an undergroup of people that will rise up against God just like Satan and his group did in the heaven above. And in that, and, they'll, and at that time, it will finally be wiped away. Now, for us to enjoy great fellowship with God, sin has to be absent. That's why in the here and now, and we struggle with this flesh every day, the only fellowship we can enjoy is minute amounts along the way because this flesh gets in the way. But can you imagine, and I can't, but can you imagine when that is no longer necessary and we dwell with the Almighty day in, day out throughout the ceaseless ages. That's what heaven is about. That, that, that is what heaven consists of. And so he reminds them of that. Then notice uh, it says that he was going to wipe their tears away in the end of verse 3. Now, we can't understand that in the here and now because uh, there's always seemingly someone to give up there's always illness, tragedy, something going on somewhere. But can you imagine no reason to cry ever? Not one reason, no, not one upsetting event, not one smackerel of grief. All of it be gone, all under the goodness of the Lord. And that's what he's saying here. And the reason why there's no need to, gr to grieve is because all sin is gone. If you really look at, at every instance when we experience grief and we experience crying, uh, uh, crying, it's the result of sin. When we see people die, if they live to be 85 years old, when they die, it's the result of sin. Uh, it was a curse placed on us in the seed of Adam that we would die. And so all that swiped away, and now we live eternally with the Lord God. Uh, verse uh, 4, And God shall wipe all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now that sounds like a place I'd like to be. And, and you think even, uh, even with no more pain, no, nothing ever hurting again. And, and seemingly the older you get, the more aches and pains and groans that you have. And 
That not being an issue anymore. You know what I found with my own pain? It gets in, in, in the way of things I want to do. And it keeps me from being able to do them. And, and I really believe it. I can't imagine at, at a time when there's no pain and, and you can do everything and whatever you need to do to praise the Lord, there's nothing outside our scope. That's how this is going to be. Verse 5. And he said, and, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Make all things new. Uh, you know, uh, you know why we get discouraged at times? Because of sin. Is it encouraging to come when there's only a handful of people to meet? We'd be lying if we said that it was. Why is that? Because of sin. Amen. Uh, people have no desire for truth in the modern day. Uh, people aren't interested in what the Bible says. I was talking to someone at work a few days ago, and we were talking about midweek services. And... I could not believe how many people says, well, I can't go because of this. I can't go because of that. I can't go because... You know, can you imagine what a time will be when this is the only priority? There's literally nothing else to do. That we will be around the throne. That's when all of it, and that, that's what it being new is about. That's what the uh, beginning again is all about. None of these hindrances now exist so we can, uh, we can serve the Lord as we should. Verse 6, And he said unto me, It is done. Now, uh, of course, this is future tense, but, you know, when God writes a thing and when he ins inscribes a thing and when he says a thing, when he says it's done, it's as good as, I mean, even though it's future, it's done. It's been said that way. It's going to occur that way. When he foreknew people unto himself, they was as good as saved already. It would, it would happen in time. And this sinless age that is coming, it certainly will uh, will come because it's decreed by God. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega. Now, in the Greek alpha alphabet, uh, Alpha is the first character. Omega is the end character. In the English alphabet, that would be the same thing as I am A to Z. I am everything in between. I am full. I, I am the full context of God. I know everything. I am everything. And I will be everything. That's what he was saying. I am Alpha and Omega. You know, that's the kind of God that I want to serve. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I don't want to serve a God that maybe can save you. I don't want to serve a God that saves me and leaves the rest up to me. I want one that's from the beginning to the end. That's God the whole time. That, that's God throughout the ceaseless ages. That that is the very God that said, "Let there be light." That's the God I want to serve. The best from the beginning to the end. And and so we see that. He decrees himself what the end is going to be, and he identifies himself as the one to make to be able to make it happen. And he said unto me, It is done, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end. I will give unto them that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now, every one of us has experienced good times and bad times with the Lord, cold times and 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 hotter times uh, but I dare say that a lot of us has experienced lukewarm periods more than not you know that's what he said to the church at Laodicea uh, I would that you were whole, cold or hot and here we find that in in this day at, at, this, at this time that all that all that stuff that pulls us away from the Lord God is going to be uh, going to be done away with. But I want you to see, it says a thirst. Now, this is the you know the only person that can tell that you're thirsty is you. 
Uh, you know, that's one thing. In all my years of taking care of the elderly, one thing that I will always, and probably when I'm old and there myself, I still be doing it, is offering people water. Now, the reason we do that all the time is they're no longer thirsty. That's one of the dries of life that goes away when you get older and you just don't, you truly don't feel thirsty. And, and so it's not too, too extraordinary or out of, out of context for him to say those that are th thirst, those individuals that are thirsty for the things of God. See, thirst for the things of God is a drive that is not natural. Now, in the natural state, when we're young, healthy people, being thirsty and being hungry is what drives us toward life. But as we get older, we get less and less and less interested in that, and eventually we go on out of this place. But can you imagine that uh, being constantly thirsty and interested in the things of God. That's what the new heaven will be like. That's what our desire, no other desire whatsoever, but to be in that throne room of the Lord God. And so that's a good spiritual measure for you tonight. And you can look unto yourself if you're really thirsty or not. Now, like any spiritual measure that I would ever suggest to you, the main thing is to be honest. If you're not thirsty after the things of God, if you're not thirsty after the fruits of the Spirit, just be honest and pray about it. But the individual that's in line with the things of God that, that is found to be in His will, they will be thirsty for the things of God. And those that don't care, it's a spiritual issue. You can paint it with many colors, but it is a spiritual issue. And so we find that He makes that apparent that this thirst is a natural drive for those that love him. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Now, as good Baptist people, we always want to grace, 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 grace. But I want you to see that there is qualifier here, and it is him that overcometh. Uh, you know, there's a lot of fakes out there today. And when I say fakes, I'm not talking about Catholics or Lutherans. There are a lot of fake people like us. Good, sovereign grace Baptists that know all the points and relish in them, but we're just fooling ourselves. Yeah. Just fooling ourselves. And, and so we find that that type of individual in that day is going to be set aside, that, that they're no longer going to be there. They're no longer a hindrance. And so I want you to see, to be in this, uh, this everlasting reign, following the millennial reign, you have to have something genuine with Christ. There will be nothing fake about this place. He that overcome, uh, uh uh, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, verse 7, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, but the fearful. Now, he's fixing to list a number of qualities of people that don't thirst and are not genuine people. And the first one is fear. Now, the fear of God is a worthy thing. In fact, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of smart things. That's the beginning uh, of getting a spiritual mind about you. But the fear of the things of this world is carnal. Now, with that said, every one of us is, uh, that I'm looking at this evening, we're all built of the same flesh. We're all put together the same way. We're all carnal in that, in, in that respect. So fear is a daily part of our lives. Yeah. Uh, afraid that there's not going to be enough money at the end of the month. Afraid that the food's going to run out. Uh, afraid that at any time financial catastrophe could happen to our land. Uh, all kinds of fear, illness. Listen, this COVID has been devastating to our nation. And I believe that the politicians have run with it, but that's their history. They run with everything that comes along. But it's a real disease. It is a real problem. And you know what? People are scared. 
People are fearful. But with that said, just remember all fear that is not directed toward God is carnal. It is something sinful. It is something that this uh, that we as spiritual people ought to try to set aside. So we find that uh, as the Lord God is, is, is speaking and John is recording that this sin of fear, it's not going to be there. It's not going to enter in. It's not going to be part of the last thing. But the fearful and the unbelieving and abominable. Now, I won't stay uh, on abominable abominable for very long uh, but that is like an individual that literally uh, feeds on misery and flesh you know uh, I like mysteries and I watch them on my phone sometimes but what that has taught me largely is this we live in a day where people lack natural affection you know I always thought as a young preacher that that was sodomy, men running with men and women running with women and lacking the natural desire uh, for the opposite sex. But I, I, go, I believe it goes way beyond that. I, I believe it goes to the, the area where, where young men and young ladies literally walk in the bedroom and shoot their mom and dad to death. That's just not natural. Yeah. But it's the day that we live. And, and, and what that would fall in the context of this verse is abominable. Who would kill their own parents? But you hear it again and again. Who would kill their own children? I remember, I think we were living in Dresden at the time or right before we left to go to West Tennessee. And Donna was expecting Abby. And we saw this news item where a woman had placed her eight-week-old infant in the microwave and turned it on. And, of course, it killed the child. You know what? That's just not natural, is it? I mean, that, that's beyond comprehension. And that's where we live today. But can you imagine when the abominable, when those abhorrent acts, you never hear one more of them. You, you never hear of a tragedy like that again. That's what heaven is going to be. That, that is what awaits us in glory. So those will be cast in. Notice the others. Murderers. All the way from Charles Manson to somebody to an abortionist taking his syringe and pushing it in. All those individuals. Never again will you have to read about a murder or somebody sly or someone getting caught after 50 years. None of that will happen. It'll be put away. Hormones. You know, we live in a day and age, and uh, I'll point out to you the scriptures, it doesn't mention the women here. It mentions the men. And uh, I was reading... Uh, we, uh, I was watching a movie not too long ago. It was set in the 1940s, somewhere along in there. And a young lady became uh, with child, and she wasn't married. And, and the, the, the whole movie was kind of about how that impacted her life. And all through the thing, I was like, what about the dad? What about the man? What about the other one? You know what? Whole movie, he was never even mentioned. But I want you to see, according to this text, that drive from men, not only to do that, but to care for nothing but themselves, that will be gone. All those individuals, will be, those types of sin will be cast into the sea and we'll never have to even contemplate them again. Sorcerers. Uh, October the 31st is coming right up, and it is a very real thing. Witchcraft right here in rural Stewart County. It's a reality. It happens all the time. Those individuals uh, are real people, and listen, they'll be cast into the lake of fire. That will never, ever be appealing to a young person again because it'll be gone. It'll be done with. Uh, another mystery show I was watching, and, and this young boy, uh, they finally found his car in a lake somewhere, and and, and he, uh, he got into this satanic stuff and had all the tattoos and junk like that. 
And he was just gone one day. 17 year old boy. His cult killed him. That's just unbelievable, isn't it? People you call friends and you think that you're in a group with literally bludgeon you to death, throw you in your own car and push you out in the lake. That's the day we live in. Sin is rampant. It is an unbelievable day. And can you imagine what a wonderful, wonderful time when that's cast away and, 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 and we no longer have to worry about it whatsoever again. That's what's coming. And then he says, and all liars. Now I've often wondered why that is put in this text. And certainly, you know, a lot of that, a lie is a lie, it's what mama always told me. But you know the worst type of liar there is? The one that would say, hell's not real. The one that would say to you, if you just sign this card, all is well. If you say a little prayer after me, you're saved. If you're baptized, things is going to be all right. If you pray to Mary, it's going to even be better. Those are spiritual lies. Those are lies that damn souls to hell. And, and I certainly know Christ can intervene, but you know what? There's a special place in hell for people who deliberately profane the name of God and lead people in their own way. That is a damnable, abominable, abominable sin. And we find in this day that those type of liars will be gone. Now, if all the liars are gone, what is left? Only truth, right? That's all they can. If all the lies are gone, all that remains is truth. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what this day will be like. Then notice what the end result is. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, that's what's going to culminate is the, abol the abolishment of sin. That is just as wonderful. I'm going to read a couple of other verses concerning the beauty that lies there for us. But the, what makes that beauty so appealing is that sin is gone. Sin no longer exists. Sin is now no longer even close to us. All these people, all this uh, sin activity that we've read about through verse 8 is cast away from us. It's no longer close. It can no longer impact us, and it's gone. Verse 9, and there, came one, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the last seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talk to me saying come hither and I will shew you the, the bride the lamb's wife so we have one wife the new Jerusalem we have the lamb's wife the, the redeemed uh, uh, of his age and he says I'm going to show you I'm going to show you this other one also I want you to see that the very same angel that brought damnation and wrath is the very same angel that shows the glory and goodness. Now, very similarly, the Holy Ghost, only through the Holy Ghost can the realities of hell begin to purge you, to begin to make the reality, the life after this place, a real one. And in the very same way, that one that poured out his vials is now showing the beauty and the goodness of God. The glory of heaven that's away. The very same individual. Uh, so we, 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 see that, we, we see the great glory of God in that. He said, and, he, and verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and shewed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God in her light 
was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates, uh, and at the gates twelve angels. And names were written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the three gates, uh, and on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And all and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in him the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now, I, I really can't get my mind around that, but I, I mean, can you imagine entering the gate that belonged to Judah? Enter, entering the gate that has Benjamin's name across the top. You know, I don't think that's figurative. I, I believe those gates will exist exactly as the Bible says. And can you imagine looking at them and, and, and thrilling at the fact that you read about those? I understood what they were. I, I was looking for them. And then the very foundation and, and looking and seeing Peter, James, John, and the, and the layers of the foundation going up. That, that, that's something that, that I really can't get my hand around, but yet still I know that it'll be the very thing that happens. The very thing. And, and identifying those, uh, <laughs> the beauty is unreal. I've often thought about, uh, and, and I don't necessarily like uh, drawing pictures or painting pictures of glory, but you would like to get your mind around and just imagine just a little bit of the beauty that will exist without sin. And that's the real thing is sin is put away. And verse 15, and he talked with me, and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square. The length is is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with a reed 12,000 furlongs long, the length and the breadth and the height are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of man, that is, the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto the clear glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third Ch chadisnokdoni, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardix, sardix, the sixth sardis stone, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the twelfth chrysopheris, the eleventh janseth, and the twelfth amethyst. Now, uh, I don't think we lose anything in the translation. I don't believe this was a a, a happenstance. I believe those those layers will be there, and the very layers will have the appropriate apostle's name on it, and it will it, it's what will hold up the New Jerusalem. You know what that really is? The truth of God holding up the very thing that He promised. Now, the next time that someone comes your way and the devil will send them and questions what that book has to say, questions you what even salvation really is, that they don't know the term, you remember this, that the very new city rests on that book. It's real. It's true. It's an encouragement to us. And we should never, ever, ever uh, let it go. Just remember, at your most discouraged uh, point, look what's waiting for you. Look what's ahead.